Eric here is already with us. Our presenter, Eric Jones, is an assistant state engineer over application and records for the Division of Water Rights. He has worked for the state of Utah before and after graduating from University of Utah in civil and environmental engineering. Eric enjoys, enjoys outdoor rec recreational with his wife and four children. Uh, he is a lifelong resident of Utah. He has been to a lot of states. Uh, he he loves traveling. His career goal has always been to be a, has always been to be of service to community on which he lives in and to his um, work community. So, with without further ado, let's get started. Eric, you can take it or take it from here. I will mute myself. I will turn off my videos, but I'll be in the background. So, if we have any technical glitch, I will come and try to fix it. Uh, it's all over to you, Eric. Awesome. Thank you. Um, this is going to be a little of a unique experience for me. I, uh, I like to make jokes, and if I don't hear laughter, then I start to get a little panicky that uh, they're not funny. But I do laugh at my own jokes quite a bit, so I think we'll be okay there. So um, I, I appreciate that the bio that was read, I did have a joke in there that he skipped over, which is I only enjoy out rec recreating outdoors as long as my teenage daughter has a good attitude which is uh, not very often, but so I usually leave her, leave her at home and enjoy the, the great outdoors that we have here in the state of Utah. Um, so again, uh, this is a presentation we'll be about. I'm gonna touch quickly on uh, water rights in Utah and give you some general ideas and concepts that are important. And then we will talk about um, the collection of, of rainwater and, and the legal uh, hoops that you have to jump through to do that on on different uh, scales. So, so when the state was first established with the, the pioneer settlers in 1847, a year later, Brigham Young, who led the first party into the state of the, the Mormon pioneers, uh, say that, stated that the, the water should not have any private ownership, that the water is of the people and for the people and for their beneficial use. And so they, they, they went forth with this practice and began developing the water resources throughout the, throughout the entire state. And parties were sent off to different parts of the state and uh, they would develop canals, irrigation companies, cooperatives, uh, private individuals set up their own diversion structures on any surface source that they could find. They started to dig shallow wells where, where they could along rivers and, and different things to develop every water source that they could find to uh, grow crops and generate uh, a livelihood here in the state that would sustain the future generations that they knew were, that were still on their way to the state of Utah. Um, so that's how it went for many years. Water disputes were handled within the ecclesiastical callings. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they have bishops and stake presidents. And if there was a dispute between two parties, it was first handled by the bishop, which is like on a neighborhood level. And then if that bishop couldn't resolve it, it was elevated up to the stake president, which oversaw multiple neighborhoods um, or congregations. And then if it, the stake president couldn't handle it, then it was elevated up to uh, higher levels within the church leadership organization. Um, one interesting fact on the Spanish Fork River, uh, that is still today regulated by what's called the High Council of Decision. Um, so the High Council is a group of people within the stake um, that, uh, that work cooperatively to, to oversee and manage the congregations there. So they made a decision, and still to this day, the, the river commissioner on the Spanish Fork River uses the High Council decision to, to distribute water. Um, so after many years of that process, it became, it became too tedious for the ecclesiastical leaders to, to maintain and the federal courts, district courts that were in the state started to take kind of control of it. And uh, furthermore, the, the federal government said, hey, if you want funding, you need to establish a water code uh, that, that uh, everyone adheres to and lives by. And so shortly thereafter, Utah water law was written into the constitution and title 73 was written. And it's declared in Title 73, uh, Section 1, uh, sub, sub bullet 1, water is the property of the public. And that is important. Um, 
And the main objective of the water law is to promote the beneficial use, uh, the, the most beneficial use of the water within the state. And um, we do that by ensuring uh, regulation and diversion to what we believe to be beneficial uses. And so that kind of goes down from the first beneficial use is people and then the uses necessary to sustain those people are, are, are secondary to the people themselves. So we have all these different codes. It's a long section. Um, you spend, you can spend a lot of time reading through all these different points. Um, there's a lot of, of nuances to it. Uh, we're going to discuss briefly kind of these, these bolded items over here as we kind of step through these slides talking about, about water law and some of the, uh, the myths that are kind of out there in the in the public as far as what our division does with regulation of, of water rights in the state. So these are the general elements of a water right. Um, if you go to our website, which is uh, waterrights.utah.gov, and you type in any water right number, which is two numbers, hyphen, and then anywhere from one to five numbers uh, following that, and the entire state is broken out into into these uh, two-digit prefixes. Uh, so here in this valley, in the Salt Lake Valley, they're, they're the 59 and 57 area divided right along the Jordan River. Um, but other characteristics of the water rights that are important is one, who owns the water right? That is key. Um, since Utah water law is, is loosely based on mining law and mining claims, uh, we believe the same thing. So it's first in time, first in right. And so it's important that the person declare, I was here first, I was here on such and such date, um, and I'm this person. And so with the ownership, they're given a priority date. Now, when the early settlers came, and prior to the establishment of Utah water law, we refer to those as diligence claims, where people were diligently using the water. And so once water law was established in 1902, um, uh, the, those diligence claims were, were made of record and they were to come into the state engineer's office and, and fill out a paper saying, this is where I've been using it. And I've been using it since this date. And so they were given a priority date of, of what they claimed at that time. And that was just for surface sources. And about 30 years later in 1935, um, we, our division started to do that for underground sources as well. Again, if there was someone that already had a well drilled and they, all they had to do was come in to uh, the state engineer's office and declare certain things as far as, as we see here on this slide, the, the quantity of water, the priority date, um, either the flow rate or the, the volume of water that they used, if they had any storage, where their point of diversion is located, um, then the nature of use that they were using the the water for typically at that time it was for irrigation domestic and stock watering and since then uh, we've had other uses in, in, you know mining municipal and we also have industrial commercial uses and then they had to define how much they were using so for irrigation that would be acreage for stock watering that'd be number of head of equivalent livestock units so one cow or one horse is equal to one um, but then if you had 33 chickens, then that's equal to one cow. So, and we have a handy little calculator that kind of calculates that out for everybody, depending on what livestock you're, you're watering. Um, and then again, the period of use is crucial. Uh, there's many decrees in the state that just say the irrigation period. And so that could be anytime there's no longer snow on the ground, now they can irrigate. So that's the irrigation period. And then the, period, the place of use is also crucial to, uh, to defining a water right. And that comes into play a little bit later. I'm going to talk about where it comes into play uh, with some forfeiture understandings and, um, and protections of water rights. Uh, so if you don't have your place of use defined properly, uh, then, but you're still using your water, right, then you might still have some, some legal issues that you have to overcome. Um, because you're not using the water as described. But, but again, I'll talk about that in a minute and we'll uh, kind of go through how to overcome that and how to protect uh, a water right uh, from forfeiture claims. 
Um, okay, so priority in general is the date of filing and application. So we, so the Division of Water Rights, like I said, we have numbers that break the estate up into certain geographical hydrologic boundaries, which are a two-digit number with a hyphen and then and then the and then the last number. Um, but really, the important thing is the application. So we have applications to appropriate, uh, which is a typical application. Um, that provides the underlying priority date of a water right. And that's the date of filing. So if someone were to file an application appropriate today, they'd have a priority date of August 8th, 2023, which is a terrible priority date in any part of the state uh, as it comes to, to regulation. And that's because first in time, first in right. So if at any time there's not enough water, whoever has the most junior priority is cut off first. Um, and then again, I, I, I touched on diligence claims. Now, if there is evidence that shows that someone has been using water since prior to the enactment of uh, the Utah Water Code, so the dates are 1902 and 1935, if there's evidence showing that someone has been using water prior to those dates up until today, they could file a diligence claim today. But it's not really easy to provide that evidence because it has to be first-hand knowledge and so you really need like a journal or you need something in, the, in a local newspaper that 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 outlines that use to file a diligence claim today um and then there are decrees so a decree is set by a court um all the evidence is gathered together and given to a judge the judge reviews it and he decrees or she decrees the the uses within a given area um, and, and once those are decreed, then it's decreed. And, and, uh, I'll talk about this on a little bit later on a different slide, but a lot of decrees are given the same priority date. So if, if you have a collection of water rights, let's say like on the severe river, um, they all have the same priority date, but what they have different is they have different classes of, of water rights and different rivers have different classes. So some rivers have like class A, class B, class C or some rivers are given first, second, third, third class rights, et cetera, uh, of that nature. And that's what the distribution engineers or, or the river commissioners use to regulate uh, the delivery of, of surface waters is that class of right. And they know once the river hits a certain flow, and again, I'll talk about this on a different slide with, with a nice image to show it, um, then they cut off certain users. Groundwater rights are also regulated by priority, um, in particular areas that have groundwater management plans, and there are several throughout the state. And in those areas, we've come in and said, hey, we're now exceeding safe yield as far as what can be diverted from the ground. And so we have to regulate and we have to cut back groundwater consumption to that safe yield point. Um, and so any water right that is above that safe yield will be curtailed and, and regulated over time down to get us within that, that safe field value. Um, again, and that's all, that's all spelled out in groundwater management plans. And so one of the probably most infamous groundwater management plans that we have in this state is the Barrel Enterprise one, where it was clear and obvious that they were exceeding safe field. You had sand subs land subsidence, you had wells dropping in water level, and so the, the, the state engineer at the time said, hey, we've got to do something. We've got to do something immediately. So we came in, said, here's the plan. And um, what it is, it's over a number of years, that valley has to uh, reduce the amount of diversion from the groundwater system. And so they're working cooperatively as, as a valley to, to be good stewards of their groundwater to prevent um, any further damages to the aquifer there. Okay. Oh, sorry. So next, this is the slide I was talking about where, where it graphically shows priority on a stream. So this is for, this would be for a surface source. And one thing that the, the pioneers did well, I believe, is that they came in and said, hey, we're going to work together on this stream and everyone is going to get cuts uh, together. So, so we all have the same priority. So let, so in 1873, a group of people came in and established some diversion and they, and they were determined to be the first priority on the river. So if we look at the, the stream flow hydrograph, we see that in 
the early part of the irrigation season, which would be the end of March, beginning of April, first class water rights do not receive their full allocation. So they receive some percentage and every water right holder uh, on the system that has the first priority, they would get whatever percentage that is, if it's 50%, 60%, 70%, and the river commissioner will regulate that, will regulate their head gates uh, to, that, to that percentage. But then in late May, or excuse me, in late April until July, first priority water rights receive their full allocation. And since first now first priority water rights are, are uh, satisfied fully, now second priority water rights can start to receive some of their allocation. And again, they're regulated the same way as a group and as a collective. And um, if there's a cut, then everyone that has a second class or second priority water right receives that same percentage cut. Um, and so then we see that second class priority rights are fully satisfied in between May 21st until about July 2nd. So then at that time, now the third priority water rights can be, can, can have some water and they are only fully satisfied in between May 21st until the first part of June. And then they have to get, then they get cut, they get a percentage cut. And in some systems, you, we, we do see this where there is water above and beyond what the priority classes have allocated. And so what that water does is it passes through everybody and goes down um, to the terminal water body or out of the state uh, to a different, to a neighboring state if it's an inner stream flow. Um, one, one interesting thing to think about though is, is the water that's above and beyond all the priority classes, uh, is that up for appropriation? And, and in short, the answer is yes, with the understanding that you're going to get the water for about two days out of every year on this system. And this is probably representation of a, of a good water year. So on an average water year, anything, I mean, anything above the, the third priority is probably not going to getting any water. Um, okay, so we measure water either through flow or through volume. Typically on surface sources, we do flow. Um, I don't need to talk too much about this. I feel like the, the people that are in this room have, have a good understanding of what flow and volume are. I just throw that in there because it's an important aspect and it's something that we use to regulate uh, the diversion and, and use of water in the state. Okay, the point of diversion is, is, is key to a water right. Um, one water right may have multiple points of diversion. Um, they also may have multiple types of diversion. So one water right can have a surface and an underground. It could have spring, it could have a drain. Um, you could have multiple wells spread out through an entire valley. Uh, under one water right. In fact, most, municip most municipalities have that, where they have one water right and they have like 10, 20, 30, I don't know how many wells that feed their municipal system. And that's all covered under one water right. And, uh, and on, on the inverse of that, one well can have more than one water right in it. So you can have neighbors that share a well, um, or like I said, again, going back to that municipality example, uh, a municipality will have 10 to 20 to 30 water rights in the same well. So, and that, that happens, um, that's happening more and more in, nowadays as land is being changed over from farm to um, urban. Uh, the developers are typically required by the municipality in which the development is occurring to provide water rights to the municipality so that they can provide water to that development. And so they take the irrigation rights or the livestock rights and they file a change application and change it to municipal use. Um, and the, every, every point of diversion needs to be described by meets and bounds. And that is again, crucial. Um, and that comes into play, and, we'll, and I'll talk about it later, how it comes into play uh, with, as far as forfeiture goes and, and uh, how other water users can look and are protected by what's described on the paper water right. Um, so here are some typical types of beneficial use. We have the classics, the irrigation, stock watering, domestic, and municipal, but we also have commercial use, industrial, power, mining, and some of these uses are consumptive, 
some of these uses are non-consumptive. And I'll talk about that in a minute, the difference uh, between those uses. Um, so the beneficial use is the measure limit uh, um, of every water right. So if it doesn't have a beneficial use, then it really is not a water right. Um, so on every application, the, the use or the nature of use is, is very key to the definition um, of, of how the water is being used. And again, that all comes into play in I'm, I'm really I'm really selling one certain slide, so hopefully it's not a letdown once I get there. Okay, so again, I touched on this briefly. We have div diversion versus depletion. So we have uh, the diversion is the removal of water from the natural system for some beneficial use. Um, so you divert it from a stream and you put it on your on your farm. Some of that water gets consumed or depleted and some of that water returns back to the groundwater system, or if there's enough water flowing across, that it'll be runoff that flows back into the natural body of water. Now, you can have diversion without depletion. So you can have a non-consumptive water right, and that would be for like um, power generation. There's lots of power generation water rights where they divert it out of the natural system, run it through a turbine, then put it back into the natural system. Um, in fact, the Provo River is, is highly dependent upon um, some old power water rights and how those are operated to protect other water users. Um, so I think, I think that uh, is, is sufficient there, okay? So here we have, there are different varieties of, of water rights in Utah. So I've been mostly talking about water rights themselves. So a water right is an application that is filed to the state of Utah or the state engineer's office. Then we review it and we either, we have to take one of two actions on it. We either approve or we reject. If it's approved, then it becomes a water right and then there's a water right owner associated with that water right for whatever uses were approved. Now a water share is pretty similar in that you have an application filed to the, to the state of Utah, the state engineer's office, then we issue an approval and assign a water right number. Um, but that water right goes to an irrigation company. So now the irrigation company hands out shares of stock in that irrigation company, and then you have a shareholder. And so our division does not typically do anything with shares of stock and shareholders within irrigation companies until that shareholder comes to our office and says, I want to use this for something different than what is defined under the irrigation company's water right. Irrigation companies never divest themselves of a water right. What they do though, is they allow a shareholder to change the nature of use to something different, uh, either utilizing the irrigation company's de de delivery system, or they can switch to like a well and use their own delivery system to get water to their property. Um, so those are the two types. So often that's a question that we get quite a bit in our office and they start talking and we're like, okay, are we talking about a water right or a water share? Um, and so that's one determination that we have to make before we can answer a lot of questions that we get. Okay, so here's the slide that I've been selling quite a bit throughout the presentation. It's about forfeiture. So one of the, one of the common phrases in Utah is use it or lose it, um, which means you have to use your water right or else you're gonna lose it, the state will come and take it away. Um, and in the recent past, the statute has changed. I believe it was 2008 is when the statute changed that said that state engineer could no longer forfeit a water right without judicial action. And so forfeiture still occurs and still can occur if it can be shown that a water right has not been exercised for a period of seven consecutive years. So it has to be consecutive. So if you have a water right, you use it this year, you don't have to use it again until 2029 uh, and then, or excuse me, 2030, and then you use it again and that water right is still protected, okay? So um, senior water right holders, the, they have like the best priority on a system and they're kind of, uh, they kind of rule over an entire system, right? If they have the best priority. And so they can do this, they, they can exercise this. However, um, if at any point they haven't used it for seven consecutive years, the junior users can now like make claim 
and say, hey, they haven't used it for seven consecutive years. If they put this back to beneficial use, they are going to impair my use that I've become reliant upon because of their non-use. Um, and that's found in the uh, Utah code. I always give the references and then in my mind, it always says people don't care about the reference, but the reference is 73386 is, um, is that reference to this. It's called the rebuttable presumption of quantity impairment. And that is to protect junior uh, uh, appropriators in a system from senior appropriators from negligence or non-use on their own part. Now, through that process, that water right that hasn't been used for seven consecutive years is only subject to forfeiture. It is not forfeit. The water right is still technically valid and still could be back, put back to beneficial use um, by the water right owner. Now it has to be put back being diverted from the approved point of diversion and at being used for the approved uses and at the approved place of use. And if they can do that for 15, 15 years consecutively, um, then the water right is put back to good standing. And that in that 15 year period, if anyone makes claim of interference or impairment, then, then there's an issue that has to be resolved through the court. So again, a water right not being used for seven consecutive years is only subject to forfeiture. Um, it is not forfeit. A judicial action has to take place to forfeit that water right. Now there's two types of judicial actions. There's one that's raised in, uh, civilly by a, another water user. The state engineer's office does, does uh, do a judicial action, which is called an adjudication of water rights. And through that process, we can forfeit or disallow water rights. But again, it's, it's a judge that decides, yes, that is disallowed, signs it, and, and the water right is forfeit. Now, there are protections from forfeiture, one of them being a non-use application. Any, any party or successor interest to uh, a water right um, so that would be the water right owner or anyone that may own the land where the water right is being used. Um, they can file a non-use application with our office and say, hey, I plan on using this in the future, but as of right now, I'm not using it fully or at all. And so I need to be protected. So it's like an insurance plan, this non-use application. Non-use can also be exempted if they are leasing their water right to another water user. That lease does have to be in writing and uh, provide information or if they're participating in a fouling program. Or another protection is if you have a surface source and let's say you have that third class priority right where you don't get water all the time. Um, and so if the supply is not, doesn't provide sufficient water to satisfy whatever's on your water right, whatever that is, is you're still protected. Okay, so you can't, forfeiture cannot be raised against someone that is trying to use the water, but simply can't because the supply is not there. Or if you're on a system where you're, there's priority curtailment. So if the commissioner comes in and says, we're cutting all the way back to 1910, anyone that has a junior water right to 1910, you can't use water. Those, those 1910 and um, later water rights up to the present are protected from forfeiture. We have aquifer storage and recovery projects. Those those are those protect you from forfeiture. Or if you have filed an, an, a change application that you are diligently pursuing, you are protected from forfeiture. And then we have this other class, which is public water suppliers. Um, so to be a public water supplier, you have to supply water to 200 connections on a regular basis. And if you fit within the definition as defined in statute, all of your water rights are protected from forfeiture as long as they took ownership um, prior to uh, May 2008. Um, so, so if a public water supplier takes ownership of a water right today, and that water right hadn't been used for seven consecutive years prior to today, that water right is still subject to forfeiture, even though it's owned by a public water supplier. Um, but again, so if, if you are a water right holder, um, it's important to put your water right to beneficial use and maintain records of that use. Um, so public policy that we have is to ensure that we are using the water as beneficially as possible. So 
One thing that our division did in the past, the state engineering office did in the past, is we actually over-appropriated water with the idea that over-appropriating a water supply would ensure the most beneficial use of water. And I'll talk about that in just a second in, my, in some upcoming, upcoming slides. So if you have more users than there is physical water, then we believe that the water will be beneficially used to its, to its fullest intent. Okay, so uh, we're going we're gonna to kind of switch gears here away from water law. We're going to talk about conservation, which will, which will roll us into um, rainwater harvesting. Okay, so what is conservation? Conservation is defined as this. I don't think I need to go over this too much. Um, so so there, are, there are three different ideas that we have here. It refers to the preservation of water, or it could refer to using water efficiently. Um, and then we have water conservation includes all the policies, strategies, and activities to sustainably manage the natural resources of fresh water, protect the hydrosphere, and to meet the current and future human and environmental demands, thus avoiding water scarcity. So those are kind of the three ideas that we're talking about um, with water conservation. But what, but what happens if we conserve water? So if we look at within a municipality, we have municipalities that are that are preaching water conservation, and it's a positive thing. It's a good thing, and I, and and we all should be conserving water and only using that which we need on our lawns and gardens and within our homes. We we shouldn't have any waste. And um, one thing that drove me crazy is a few days ago, I have a seven year old son who is quite rowdy and rambunctious. And uh, last week I woke up and I turned on the shower and I was like, oh man, the water pressure is really low. I live right by a park. And so I looked out and saw that the park sprinklers were going and I was like, oh, it must be because of the sprinklers. And, and uh, I was talking to my wife later in the day and I go, is the water pressure still low? She goes, yes, it is. And I'm like, oh, I wonder what's going on. And my seven-year-old had, had drugged the hose behind something that we couldn't see and he turned it on. And then that, that major thunderstorm and rainstorm came through and he forgot to turn it off because he got scared and came in the house. So anyway, so I did not, cons we did not conserve water as a family that day. Um, so I see that the question popped up. Do, I, do you want, I mean, let's see, what incentives are there to save water? I'm under the impression that if an individual saves water, then that saved water will likely just be used by the next in time in right, or if everyone needs are met, the saved water will not be saved, it'll be picked up by another individual. So I think exactly, I'm gonna talk about that on my next slide. Um, so, and, and it also applies to this slide a little bit. So as municipalities conserve, they add in population and that population then uses that block of water that was conserved by, by me or by you or by somebody else within the system. Um, so the, the water is being used or um, by, by, by the population increase, okay? So if we look at it on, on an agricultural level, so we have people that wanna switch from flood irrigation to sprinkler irrigation, they become more efficient. Um, again, I, as I mentioned, the beneficial use is the measure and limit of a water right. So if you were approved to do 10 acres of irrigation under flood irrigation and you switch to sprinkler, you become more efficient, you divert less water, you are still limited to that 10 acres of irrigation. You just are now more efficient with your watering. Now, if you, for that 10 acres, let's say you had to divert 40 acre feet for the year to do flood irrigation. But with sprinkler irrigation, you only have to divert 30 acre feet. That 10 acre feet, again, going to this question here, does flow down to the next appropriator and it, and it would typically be consumed by a junior appropriator to that, to that, uh, for that person upstream of them. So that block of water is probably being used and is probably used to bolster someone else's water right that was not receiving as much water in previous years. So that's a very good question. So what incentives are there? One, the incentives are, we wanna be good stewards of, of the water and we want to beneficially use the water to its best practice. Um, one, I know there is some monetary incentive uh, for farmers uh, to, to ensure that they're not overdoing it, right? They, they, they run on a financial budget just like everyone else and they wanna make sure that they're staying and, and being good uh, financial examples for the farm, for the crop that they're producing to sell. Um, so I, I believe that addresses your question. Uh, there's incentive one, 
I think the main incentive is to be a good steward to the environment in which we live. That that's the main that's the main incentive. Uh, for for me as a municipal user, it cuts down on my water bill. That's a huge incentive. Um, my wife yells at me because of the yellowing lawn in the summer, and I tell her I'm not paying that much money for grass. Um, it's not that important to me. Uh, and then there's again the the same incentive applies to to farmers as well. Uh, and yeah, I feel like I've addressed that question. So if I haven't, feel free to answer another, another question. Uh, Eric, yes, Eric, I think we can move on and like, okay. we will have all the questions collected towards the end. Okay. And we'll answer all these, all these questions towards the end. Perfect. I, yeah, I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. So within the legislator, we have SB 277, which was passed, which is water conservation and augmentation amendments. Here's, here's the main incentive that was recently passed by this Utah State Legislator legislative body this last year, is that if you participate in this optimization program and uh, conserve water, then you have what they refer to in legislation as saved water. And there's two aspects that there's the reduction in depletion potentially, and the deduction in diversion uh, through these optim optimization programs. So what, what you can do is you can come to the state engineer's office once you've been approved for this optimization program and file a change application and move that block of water to some other use um, once it's been evaluated how much is actually being saved with respect to diversion and depletion. And then that block, walk, block of water can be moved and marketed on the, on the open market to another user. Um, through that process, there is statute that says you cannot enlarge or improve an existing water right through the change application process. Um, and so if there are limitations, diversion and depletion, even with the saved water, those uses can't be exceeded um, uh, through the change application process, even through this optimization program. Okay, so let's move on to capture and storage of precipitation, aka rainwater harvesting. Um, and this is where it's found in code 73.3.1 and 1.5. And here, we've, here are the main elements of rainwater harvesting. Okay, so since 2010, it has been legal to harvest rainwater without a water right. Uh, for systems, for any, any harvesting system, you must register that system or is that how, that's how it was in 2010. Uh, since then, the, the code has changed that says you only have to register systems that are larger uh, than, as it says on the last bullet there, two covered storage containers not greater than 100 gallons. So if you have, if you have a large system or anything over 200 gallons, then you need to register that system with our, with our division. And that's simply done through uh, this website uh, from our website and I'll actually I'm going to hop off here and then hop onto our website and show you how to navigate to that how the way I how the way I do it and the easiest way that I found to do it so that's how we register so let's let me do this real quick um, I'm not 100% sure what everyone is seeing but let's we, go you we are seeing this yeah okay the screen. now you're, now you're seeing our yes our web page okay so if you come up here to FAQs and then if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, here we have uh, a quick question about rainwater harvesting. And then to register rainwater harvest, to harvest rainwater, you just click there and there it all is right there, okay? So this is important because statute is pretty clear on that um, you have to, the water, the parcel on which you collect water, that's where the water has to be used. It can't, it can't move off of that parcel. So you can't collect rainwater at your home and take it and, and somewhere else and use the water there, according to Utah Utah statute. Um, and so that's why that's why we have this this registration here. Okay, so we can go back here. Once it loads, I think that's pretty much all I have, how to register. Yeah, so so that's that's all I have as far as presentation goes. Um, I uh, 
let, let me see. There's a question here. I'm a landscaper and I have yes. um, I can read the questions oh, to you, okay. uh, Eric, so that yep. we have it recorded. Um, but then if you have any questions, feel free to put in the uh, Q&A sessions. Uh, thanks, Eric. This was a wonderful presentation and I do have a lot of questions as well. Okay. But let me move on to this first. Let's do uh, it. I think you already answered the first one. Uh, and then the second one is, I am from Mark Mason Teller. I am a landscaper and I help, re I help residents improve their water use, but there is huge disparity in water use. For example, last year we saved 8 million gallons of water. 1 million of that was from primary water. 7 million is from secondary water. Is there anything the state is doing to really change the residential secondary water? Um, yeah, so recent legislation has been passed that all water use should, is, is, is to be met, metered. And so that's one thing that we're doing. So there's a lot of secondary systems that aren't metered. And so we want to get a real uh, accounting of secondary water. Um, and uh, so that's one thing that's going to help. Because once, once you start seeing, so rather than being, being billed like, for a whole block for a whole year now you're being billed monthly and you're seeing your your meter reading and how much water you're actually using and, and then being charged for that water that that will help curtail some of the unnecessary secondary water usage that's going on um let me just i gotta scroll back up oh uh the what was the end part of that question what uh what else is utah doing so yeah the the second part was is there anything the state is doing to really change residential secondary water? Um, so yeah, the Division of Water Resources is working with, with residents with throughout the state to help them be more water, con water conscientious and to use water more efficiently. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so the legislation and then, and then the slow the flow program that we have within the state. Okay, so... Awesome. That's just, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, this is a very different question. How much of our Utah water system is used for mining lithium? So I don't have the exact number, but it is, it is a lot. It's in the hundreds of thousands of acre feet that, that uh, is used. And that's because it's typically done through an evaporative process using, using waters that are rich in those, in those minerals along the Great Salt Lake and other water bodies throughout the state. And so there is a lot, there is a lot of water that's used for that. Um, we do track all of that. Uh, in fact, um, I can show you where we track it on our website and you can kind of go and so if you come to data and flow records, and then we have this is called public water suppliers. So we have a program where large water users have to submit their water use data. And then, so we click that here and you can kind of filter things out. Um, by county and then what you're looking for would be under industrial supplier so then and then you can kind of come in and find some of the in large industrial suppliers um i'm just scrolling down here so if we look at like so here's compass minerals they're a large they're a large entity on on great salt lake so so you can take opportunity to kind of scroll through our website and see what how much water they're using and Typically, those are diversion values. Those are not depletion values. Um, uh, but there is, and then and then you can go look at their water rights and see how they're described as far as diversion and depletion goes. If there's a percentage assigned, or or if it's 100% consumptive of what they divert. Awesome. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Eric. The next one is if you could. Uh change one rule in Utah water policy, what would you change? That's a, uh, we'll keep this for last. I mean, um, let's see if we have something that is from the presentation, but this is very important question as well, Mark. We'll, we'll hold on. How much is a Mill Creek water share worth? Um, if, you, if you're with a municipal company, how does a water share benefit homeowner? Okay. Um, so I don't know, let's, we can see, I don't know, I don't, I think I've looked for Mill Creek before. So here we are, we have a listing of all of the water companies, we can get them by name. I don't, uh, so here's Lower Mill Creek Irrigation Company, that might not be the one you're looking for. Yeah, and we don't, like, I, I, I didn't think we had any values for that as far as the shares go. So to find out the, the share value uh, for a given irrigation company, you need to figure out who the either the president of the company is or a different shareholder and kind of work through that because irrigation companies 
all have different values um, as far as, as what one share is worth. If you're with how does a water share benefit homeowner? Um, so I'm not quite sure I quite understand the question. Yeah. Share benefit the homeowner. So, I, I mean, I look at, I grew up in a neighborhood that had an irrigation company shares and the homeowners that lived on the laterals on the ditches, they were able to obviously irrigate with, with different water and flood irrigate. Uh, and use different techniques. So, so when we look at water rights and water shares, these are all things that kind of just go into a portfolio that you want to diversify as much as possible, so you have the best available water source to your to your users. So the next one is um, what's being done on conserving agricultural water use and change the use it or lose it water rights mentality of farmer. This is very crucial, right? If you use it or lose it, I mean you are. You, are, you will use the water even if you don't need it. So is there anything being done? Um, so we, we try and do a lot of education and outreach and tell them that, yeah, you have a block of water that is 50 acre feet, but if you're efficient and you only have to use 20 acre feet, um, you, don't, you don't lose any of that right. You still maintain okay. that right as long as you're beneficially using for the described beneficial uses. The only, the only time that you come in to subject to lose it or to forfeiture is if you don't use it for seven consecutive years and that forfeiture claim is raised against you in, in a court. Awesome. So there is the, the Megan asking about, are there regulation about how to store collected rainwater as homeowner? I'm thinking about, about ground storage versus in-ground storage versus indoor garage storage. I think you can store it anywhere, right? You can store it anywhere above or below ground. That's actually one of the changes. So when it first came out, the, the, the code said, if you're doing a small system, that can be above ground. But anything larger than a small system has to be below ground. So once you got above 200 gallons, you had to, you had to put it underground. But now you can do it above or below um, any size storage. Okay. After seven years of not using water shares, does the state take it back or do they buy it back? Again, it's through uh, the judiciary system, right? It's not only the state, it's also the... Yeah, so, so water shares and water rights, the, the state doesn't take them back. What they do, again, so water, water is uh, property of the public. So all it does is that water right becomes no longer valid. And so now basically everyone's water right that was junior to them kind of improves a little bit because they are now entitled to those flows or that groundwater use that's, that can't be used by them. Um, but we don't, yeah, we don't, the state does not buy back water rights. Um, again, once, once a, a water right has to be forfeited through the court system. Um, but that is a good question. That's a question we get a, quite a bit because water rights are considered real property, just like a home or, or land. Um, and there is a, a monetary value associated with them. But again, you, you do have to exercise the water right for that monetary value to be be to be there. Okay. So the the other question is please please describe the intent intent of registering rainwater harvesting for the records, right? Or yeah. So there was great concern. Um, the interesting thing, so so I have again, I worked here while I was going through college, and while I was going through college, I did that that question came up. <laughs> what happens if every rooftop within the Salt Lake Valley collects rainwater? And so we, we kind of did that and we, we gave those, we presented those numbers to the Division of Water Rights um, at that time. And, and it, was, it was interesting and it, it, does take, it does take a block of water away from the natural system and potential other water users. Uh, so the intent is to ensure that one, there's not, there's not abuse of the water system but I, I believe that there were some municipalities that, that were uncomfortable and some irrigation companies that were nervous that some of that water wasn't going to make it and provide water to their users. And so they wanted to know how much water was, was being stored on people's property. Um, and if you, I don't know if anyone remembers that you had Mark Miller, they redid their, their car dealership downtown and they installed a large rainwater harvesting system. And Salt Lake City had to come in and kind of work with them and, and incorporate that system into their municipal water right. 
And so it's, so it's an accounting of use it's, and it's a protection for existing water right holders. Thanks, Eric. Thank yep. And I, I think we were discussing about this before we started the presentation, but like say if a nursery grower here in Utah might use culinary water to irrigate their uh, commercial production site. Now, um, with like, if they would like to collect the water that they use, it's not like typically water, right? It might be the municipal water or uh, city water. Can they collect the water that they use and recycle it back to their production system? Yeah, and, and 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 before you didn't you didn't provide the example that they could be using a municipal source. If they're using a municipal source, yeah, that's you know that's all above board. They can pump it into their nursery, okay. use it, and then kind of recirculate it through the nursery. Oh. Um, and again, what we talked about was if they have their own individual water right, they could pump that own individual water right into their system, use it, and then reuse it up until they hit their limitations of diversion and or depletion. Okay, but then they need to work with you guys at water rights, right? If it is if right. it is related to water right, then. right? If if their if their water right is defined as irrigation and they're doing that practice, um, they can still do that practice. But if they want to have like a pond added to that irrigation, then they'd have to file a change application to add that pond. Okay, that's where I was saying it's probably better just to switch the nature of use from irrigation and storage to uh, commercial use. Okay. Okay. Um, I got it. And we, we do have a lot of other questions as well. Like Vince asked, what about passive, passive rainwater harvesting? What about carp carts and soils to recharge groundwater and filter out pollutants from the surface runoff? Tucson does this and it has drained entire neighborhood without any input other than natural precipitation. Um, yeah. So I think I think natural rainwater harvesting is a great practice. Uh, designing designing landscapes that can collect the rain and filter out the the nutrients before it goes back into the groundwater aquifer is a wonderful thing. Um, would did that question include like creating storage I ponds think, of that? I think I think irrigation. I Yes, I think what Vince is asking is what about like those uh, carp carts and, and having rain garden. And I, I don't think Utah water rights would uh, block anyone from doing no. that. It, yeah. I mean, it, in fact, it's a good practice and yeah. and the peop like people are, are encouraged to do it. I mean, that's that's what I know about it. So, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So that that is encouraged. And that, yes. that doesn't require if you do landscaping like that, that doesn't require any sort of registration. Mm -hmm. of, that, of that landscaping. Okay. And again, Mark Mason Taylor asks, I'm sorry if I missed it, but how many total acre feet of water is there in Utah? That's a tough question. How many <laughs> watersheds does the state of Utah have? How many watersheds and how does a re registered water cistern need to be in the ground? I didn't get the last question, but I don't know if you got it. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I'm not going to speak to how many acre feet of water uh, was that on paper. I'm guessing that was the paper, paper question, or was that physical? It was on the chat. It's on the chat. It's on the chat. Yeah. I'm, uh, but how many total acre feet of water is there in Utah? I mean, I don't know about that. Oh yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't that. I mean, that's variable from year to year, right. Depending on the snowpack, but yeah. if, he, if he wants a paper number, I mean, we could probably crunch those numbers and get them for him, but there are, there are a lot of paper water rights and not every value that we have in our database is actually ref truly a reflection of, of that quantity of water. Okay. Um, so I'm still sharing. So if I click on this, so here's, here's kind of a map of, of the state. And this is how we break it out into, into those areas. And so that's what we have. So we have seven main regions and each one is represented by a regional engineer. And then within that, they have their own individual, uh, boundaries okay. so, and there are i mean you could and you could break those into smaller watersheds because those are a collection of of tributaries to larger systems mm -hmm. awesome um so the the other questions the question is i'm struggling to understand how issuing more water right would lead to better water use is there logic behind this i don't know if you would be able to answer this eric like it's um uh, because it seems like an artificially imbalanced market where demand cannot be satisfied. Um, I mean, the demand of water 
can't be satisfied if we don't if we don't do any conservation measures. So so we do need to conserve water to satisfy the demand uh, of Utah population. But then uh, when you move on to like how the water rights uh, lead to more water rights lead to better water use and all, I, I don't have an answer to that. I don't know, Eric, if you do or. Yeah. So so I did miss the second part of his prior question. and And it does not have to be in, in ground. I believe, I believe the statute changed where you can have a larger system above ground. So larger than 200 gallons above ground. Um, and so that, so that, that concept of issuing more paper water than physical water. Uh, I, I think the word better is probably the misnomer there. It's, it's not, it's not better. Um, it's that it is beneficially used. So that's, that's the intent behind that, that idea is that um, the idea of the of the early Utah law was to ensure that it's all being used for some beneficial use prior to being lost either to a terminal water body or to, to other states. Okay. So yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think better better is not not the proper word in that question. Mm -hmm. It's beneficial. Okay, thanks. Uh, and there's a question for me. Is there a decline in biostimulants when using culinary water? Mark, I, I think using culinary water or the secondary water does impact production depending on the quality of water that we use. But I haven't come across a research where we see decline in biostimulants using culinary water. I know the nursery that do irrigate using culinary water do apply some biostimulants or some kind of like microbes to um, to help the plant plant perform better. But I I don't know I that, yeah I don't know the answer to that, Mike. Sorry. Uh, and there is another question: If a proper if water is the property of public, why does agriculture still dominate the, uh, the allowed use? When the benefit of agriculture use has limited benefit to overall population, a hay feeding her, a horse, for instance, instance currently takes priority over a residential subdivision. Now, again, this is a type of questions. I think um, that would be situated like that would be good for a lawmaker or, 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 or people working on those rules and regulations. I don't know if. I can answer your question. Sorry, but I don't know if Eric, do you want to take on it? You don't have to. I mean, oh no, that's fine. It's a question we get quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, so the first tenet of Utah water law is first in time, first in right, and agricultural users dominate. Uh, I, I like to actually like that word dominate because they have the senior priority in most systems throughout the state. Um, and so that's that's the main main reason why. But a lot of the as those uses transfer over to municipalities, then, then, then it starts to balance out differently. Mm -hmm. So I think that is, that is all. There's one more about the data center cooling system. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. The uh, data center cooling system that use an external, extraordinary amount of water, who is capable of approving those applications? Is it committee, the governor, governor, et cetera? So who would um, say so that? Okay. Yeah, that's that's our office. This, the Office of State Engineer reviews those applications. Um, and again, so the like the NSA building, and they were util utilizing a lot of Bluffdale Irrigation Company shares. And through that change application, we evaluated it, and as they they were assigned a diversion limitation and a depletion limitation. And as long as they stay within those those values, then the hydrolyte system should. Um, maintain a balance okay and i i am always like confused about this cooling system they don't actually consume the water they are just like sending the water to cool the system and then we could reuse and reuse that water right it's right yeah, yeah so i mean there's a, there's always there's the two aspects there's the diversion which is usually a large number and then the depletion depending on the use is is anywhere from zero to 100 percent so of, of the diverted value Awesome. And so, I believe the cooling systems are, are on the lower percentage size of, side of depletion. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I think this, is, this was a very, very helpful presentation, Eric. I mean, I learned a lot. And um, okay, Ben said, my question was partially answered. I'm speaking of altering the curb of a street by cutting V in the curb to capture water into swells in the parking strip. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah. So I, I, I kind of, kind of goes along those same lines, uh, um, of, of stormwater is to return to back to the natural system. Some of the stormwater gets collected and put into irrigation canals. Uh, so, but, but cutting these into the curb that then diverts water into, a uh, an infiltration basin is a positive thing because that helps remove some of the contaminants that would likely get to the natural system uh, if, if allowed to go into this, the stormwater and, and out to a natural body. Is it legal? Um, it's gray. It's a gray legal area, but yeah, it, it, I mean, if you think about it, so that area probably once was uh, permeable. And now we've come and put this impermeable surface. And so that water historically would have gone and fell on that ground and, and percolated down to the groundwater. So, so some might look at that and say it is legal. And some might look at that and say, no, that's water that's supposed to come to me. But, but so it's yeah. great. I'm I think, I think looking at, for the legal aspect, I like Ricky Smith answer, check it with the ticket check with the city on cutting curbs. But I think each city has their um, rules and regulations regarding how like curb cuts and, and water conservation and rainwater harvesting as well. So if you can check that, I mean, it, they, might, they might have an answer to you, Vince.